Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Mr. Lowenstein, for that wonderful introduction. Appreciate it. How's everybody doing? Good. Good, 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 good. By the way, I want you to know that, I mean, you know this, but you didn't fill in very much, you know, by the way. There's like all these seats right in the middle. You guys over there, come back, come back, come back over here. When the going gets tough, the American people are really behind you. So block out some of the noise and know that when your back's against the wall, we're here, okay? And if you need affirmation, just call me because we value what you do every day, okay? Really. Everybody have index cards or notepads when you came in? Okay, don't write too big on those. We're gonna write a few things on them. I would normally walk around, but I'm micless, so I'll do a little bit, but I can't go too far, or you won't hear me over there or on the webcast, okay? So, has anybody been to the Naval Academy? Any attendees of the Naval Academy? Okay, you can raise, good, cool. So imagine that you applied for the Naval Academy. Can you hear me okay? Imagine that you applied to the Naval Academy and you're excited, you score at the top of your class, you're waiting, you're rejected. Okay, life goes on, we all get rejected from time to time. You apply again, you go score at the top of your class, maybe the second time will be the charm, you're rejected again, and again, and again, seven times. You come to Washington, you meet with the higher ups, they say sorry, places are full, good luck, can't do anything about it. You get back on the train going home, somebody from the higher ups office comes to stop the train, finds you on the train, the authorities increase the number of spaces to get you in, get off the train. You're in, wow, that was quick, whiplash, right? After all this, you go to class, you're solving problems, you come up with the answers, you get weird looks from people. Professors' eyebrows go up, people kind of groan. What the heck? They can't figure out what you're doing. This happens again and again. They pull you into the back room, make you take off your shirt. They think you're cheating, writing the answers on your body. Frustrated that you're not, you just came up with the answer in a way they didn't understand. They weren't teaching, that wasn't in the textbook. Fast forward 15 years, you achieve one of the great milestones in science, you're hailed as a genius. Fast forward 10 years later, you're awarded the Nobel Prize. That is the true story of my great great uncle, Albert Abraham Michelson. I think you guys have probably heard of the speed of light, I think maybe, e equals mc squared. This is a great quote, I don't know if you can read it from there, of Einstein at a talk with Albert Michelson. My greatest, in the uh, without your work, this theory would have been nothing more would have been scarcely more than an interesting speculation. How's that for an endorsement, huh? Then they named a building after him. But he was almost thrown out of the Naval Academy because he kept coming up with the answer in ways that they didn't understand, were not in the textbook, they were not teaching. And they almost shut him down by being rude in the room, year after year after year. He was definitely an outlier who challenged norms, right? This is one of my favorite quotes that I use all the time from my great great uncle. My greatest inspiration is a challenge to attempt the impossible. You guys are attempting the impossible every day, right? You're having to see around fences, find in dark places, 
figure out with a slew of unknown variables. So let's talk about DITRA's own innovations. From what I understand, the you guys partnered with the Army Lab to find a way to solve the riddle of how do we get chemical weapons out of Syria without a nearby access point. I mean, talk about a dilemma, right? Without putting anybody in danger. This is the contraption I understand was put in from, to have remote control, really amazing stuff. And Dr. Erin Reichert, she's not here, is she, Dr. Erin? Yay, who's Erin? Hi, I've been dying to meet you. Um, Dr. Aaron, seriously, I've heard your stories. Kamo, will you correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, you were coming up with a vaccine for Ebola, and you came up with a methodology that people at first rejected, and then eventually was accepted, and became a solution. And then also, the team developed this wonderful gray bird, which, can, which could transport nine patients plus a crew instead of two, right? So you, you found a way to come up with these really cool ideas. So what do these breakthroughs have in common? They were all resisted at first. They were considered not viable or unrealistic. They required looking at it from a new angle, combining new things and things differently moving the puzzle pieces around. They were not understood at first. It's like, what, how do you do that? Where does that come from, right? But they were explored and they were probed to get to the solution, right? The Army Chief of Staff said these things are critical for national defense strategy. Strength and innovation are essential to national defense strategy. And you guys do it every day to keep us safe to deter threats, right? You're on the forefront, you're identifying hidden threats around the corners. Anybody here working on coronavirus, by the way? Anybody here working on climate change? Talk about a threat, right? You use the data, but you know what? Data is flawed. You tell me, data is flawed, it's biased, and it's incomplete. Correct? So we need to think creatively. And data does not have imagination. Logic will get you from A to B, which is what data is, and our normal logic patterns, but imagination will take you everywhere. You have to imagine where these threats are. You have to imagine how to find a solution once you find them. So what are the blocks to innovation? You can't possibly read this from there, I suppose, but these are the, this is a study from KPMG and a company called Innovation Leader on the blocks to innovation. I'm gonna focus on the top two. 55.1% of people said internal politics and turf wars were the main block to innovation. 45.3% of people said there were cultural issues were the block. These are, we're, these are in our control, folks. These are in our heads. We can manage these. We can do something about these. One of the innovators that I got to know is Jerry Hirschberg. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but Jerry Hirschberg was the first president of Nissan Design International. And he was told to put the company anywhere he wanted, to hire anybody he wanted, structure it wherever he wanted. By the way, he located it in San Diego. Smart guy, right? <laughs> and he wrote a book about it called The Creative Priority. And this is such a great quote of his from the book. Many of the strategies for fostering creativity are mechanisms for jarring us loose from our moorings for rethinking the ways we formulate our environment assumptions or relationships. You're not gonna be able to, to, to identify hidden threats if you're dependent upon incomplete data, if you're dependent upon, if you're not noticing the assumptions that you're making at the time without maybe realizing it. There is always a leap of faith, even a naivete 
in going with a notion that has no precedent or prior reality. You are in the business of finding the places that have no precedent or prior reality. So how do we remove these blocks? First of all, you create a safe space for crazy ideas. You don't have the environment that Albert Michelson encountered at the Naval Academy, right? You have an environment where people can come in and go, that's nuts. And I'll tell you a story from my own experience in a minute about that. You create an environment where leaders show their own vulnerability, where leaders tell stories of when they failed or how a crazy idea that they came up with and maybe it worked and maybe it didn't. You have an environment where they, they support crazy ideas. Somebody comes out with a crazy idea and the leader in the room says, okay, let's explore that. And people dive into it. And I'll get to that in a second. I'll tell you one little quick story. There's a group called Theater of War, not at war. And or, whichever is the one that's not in the field. And it's literally theater. And they have people come in and do pieces of plays, 30 minutes, Broadway actors and Hollywood actors. And the, the CO comes into the, these are done on the military base. And the CO comes in and, and gives the blessing, if you will, and says, we're here, this is important. They're talking about mental health in the military. And then that CO leaves. They create the safe space and then allow people to go through the experience on their own. You have to have leadership create a safe space. You collaborate. You can collaborate across DITRA, different divisions. I was talking to someone earlier about collaborating between different divisions of DITRA. You can collaborate with ARPA-E. You can collaborate with, with DARPA, maybe you do. You can collaborate with Google X, right? or Unilever's Innovation Unit. You have to break, those are the collaborations will break you loose from your moorings to come up with new ideas. Celebrate failure. There's an ad agency that actually gives awards for failure, for weird client relationship, for weird presentations to clients and, and weird pitches. You mine everybody's body of experience for insights, right? Bring in people, and you'll hear me talk about this again in a minute, but you bring in people who, who don't necessarily come from the typical background that might, you might normally hire. You want to bring in, you want to mine people's hobbies, what they do with their kids, what they did before. You want to you go into these, these idea centers and apply weird things together so that you can come up with, a, find that, that threat and find a solution that's like, okay, this might be weird, but what if we took this from over here and put it with over this, and what do you think? That's what's going to break you loose. Have a diverse team. Okay, gender, ethnicity, yes. Multi-generation. We have five generations in the workforce today for the first time in history, and that's not going to change. And everybody brings their own experience. Whether you were trained to hide under a desk from a potential nuclear attack to drills in high school to avoid a shooter, you have a body of experience that come that, that is a diversity and a, and a body of experience that can unearth new ideas and say, well, what if we looked at it this way? What if we flipped it over and turned it purple? You want a diversity of experience. You want a diversity of skills and perspectives, obviously geography, location, and gender. That's how you look around the corner, because everybody's got a different corner that they're looking around, right? And the important thing, as you saw in my story with Uncle Albert, is how do you respond? When, some, when you're in a room and somebody presents an idea that's a little bizarre, what do you do? Yourself, self-awareness. What assumptions are you making when they say that? You're going, oh, the data doesn't say this. I mean, right? There's like dialogue in your head. Stop that dialogue. How do you, but first is awareness of what you're doing this, right? What ideas are you dismissing before you even giving them a hearing? 
And what probing questions can you ask to explore the idea? Do you say, well, okay, that's new. How do we get there? Like, where, huh? I mean, it's about what happens in the room. Albert Michelson was shut down because people in the room, and this happens every day today, not just 100 years ago. It's about what happens. People don't even realize it. We don't even realize it when we go, you know, or that's ridiculous, right? One of my favorite stories is when Bill Gates was leaving to, uh, when uh, Paul, uh, Steve Ballmer was going to join Bill Gates to form Microsoft, his mother said, well, that's great, Steve, but who would want to use a computer? <laughs> Talk about an assumption, right? So how do we deal with this? How does your team innovate? Hire the outlier. Who do you hire on your team? When you're looking to hire somebody, God, I wish I could walk around. When you look to hire somebody on your team, what do you look for first? Somebody yell it out. Oh, come on. Technical experience, okay. You look for cultural fit? Hello, anybody out there? Are we alive? Energy. energy. Good. I like energy. That's cool. I propose that you hire the outlier and not for fit. I headed up the communications and co-headed the sales and marketing of the electric car division of Chrysler. We did hockey stick growth in the middle of a recession. I had no automotive experience. The word vehicle and automotive was nowhere on my resume. They were in the Midwest, I was here. I'm a New York City girl, they were not. I'll tell you that in a minute. But I was recruited, and when the wife of the CEO said to me one day, how do you like working for these people? I said, well, I'm just grateful they hired this crazy woman from New York who didn't have any car experience. And the president of the company said, that's why you were successful. You came in with more creative ideas in 15 minutes than anybody had in years. You've got to have somebody like that. You've got to have somebody who's a spark, who's going to say, wait, what if we went over here? What if we looked under this? What about over here? And if everybody's like fitting in, forget about it. Right? You're not going to find those hidden ideas. Uh, this is a blog I wrote for Forbes. What would the U.S. women's, would the U.S. Soccer, women's soccer team have won if somebody said, oh, we can't hire Megan Rapinoe. She's just too different. I mean, like, what's with the pink hair? Like, really? Think about what you can teach. He could teach me about the car business, right? Even though I'm not an engineer, and yes, I did become a bit of a car geek, but we can talk about that. Hire somebody who says, what if? That's what I did, and that's what I do today. It's come and say, well, what if this? Or what if the assumption was wrong? What if the data is wrong? Remember, AI is programmed by humans. We humans are flawed. We bring our own biases. So what if we could figure out a remote way to get those chemical weapons out? What if we could create the Mars, uh, the curiosity to go onto Mars, right? This is a great, another great quote. You can tell I love quotes. But this is from, a, from Psychology Today. This guy's a neuroscientist. Creativity, creativity goes through different pathways in the brain than reasoning does. So you've got to have, you can't hire, you can't teach being a spark. You can't teach being a catalyst. You can't teach somebody who's going to go, well, what if we flip it over and turn it purple? You can teach chemistry. You can subsidize their PhD, you can find a way to give them some of the data that you need them to have. But to her point, you can't give them energy. You can't give them that spark. Intentionally put diversity at the table. Okay, so <laughs> they moved me, New York City girl, to Fargo, North Dakota. 
Now, you want to talk about cultural fit for a minute? These never got a lot of exercise, okay? Anybody from North Dakota? I got to tell you, I loved the people, really great talent. It was my favorite job in many ways. Hated the weather, okay? But I was diversity. My boss said to me, you've managed to make your, your cultural difference a positive. That's what you need. You need somebody who's going to shake things up. And I had people come in and say, well, what, you know, what we did before you got here worked. They became my biggest advocates because we started doing things that, you know, results matter, right? So you've got to have diversity of the table. You've got to have leadership support. You guys leaders in the room, I know you know this. But you've got to, you've got to be... Um, now, when the rubber hits the road, when the president of the company introduced me, he said, North Dakota Nice wasn't working, so we brought out a New Yorker, which was a great pithy line, but it said, she's different, she's going to make changes, it's going to be uncomfortable, she's got my support in one great little pithy phrase. And you know what? He lived up to it. I'd walk into his office and he'd go, okay, I know you're here to take me out of my comfort zone. And he would support me in these, not every idea, but we did a lot of wild stuff. I can tell you about that later if you want to know. This is creating a space for crazy ideas. I actually had people on my team at Chrysler come into my office, close the door, and say, we love that you're asking us for our ideas, that you honor them. We're not used to giving them, so give us some time. I mean, that's nuts, right? They didn't have that safe space before. But you have to create it. And you have to create it every day. It's not just in one meeting. You have to create it every day. If you're, if you're presenting an idea, tell a story. I interviewed a woman recently who told me that she was doing a presentation to a client, and she used an example from her three-year-old daughter's class. Okay, I've told you stories about my story from Chrysler. I told you the story of Albert Michelson. Right? You tell a story to make it accessible to people. Ask questions that explore the idea. I don't like the idea of constructive criticism. No. I'll get to that, a related topic to that in a second. But instead of even thinking about it as criticism, just say, how'd you get there? Well, take me through that. I don't understand. How does that work? Break it down for me and probe. Explore it. When I would come into my boss's office with a nutso idea about a methane-free Christmas, he'd look at me like I had just swallowed acid. And he'd go, okay, take me through this. And I'd explain this, and he'd go, wow. And we did, got the front page of the Wall Street Journal and went all over the place. I could tell you stories about that. So you have to explore the idea and allow for constructive conflict. Actually, it's really about creative abrasion. You guys are chemists and toxicologists. You rub your hands together, right? That's abrasion, but it creates heat. That's creative. Jerry Hirschberg talked a lot about this too. And he would actually allow the conflict to sit in the room because that's the friction that creates a great idea. You bring opposing ideas together and it's some place in the middle, in the middle right? It's almost any negotiation. But respectfully, passionately, obviously, that's how you challenge the status quo. The, stu the super collider, right, is a classic example of that. Okay, so now it's your turn. Take out those index cards and a pen. Everybody have one? I don't see everybody writing. Okay. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write down a problem that you're trying to solve right now, that you're wrestling with. I don't care what it is. Just a challenge that you're trying to resolve. Now I want you to write down two people you'll talk to about it who you would not normally talk to about it, who would not, never, ever, ever be on your radar screen to talk to about it. I don't care if it's your kid's preschool teacher. I mean, you know, I understand security issues, but you get where I'm going, right? What about maybe somebody from Google X? What about somebody from the Unilever unit? What about somebody from 3M? What about somebody from a, from a university in some place? Right? The CDC today, even though you're not working on coronavirus, you know, maybe there's somebody, they, they're coming up with novel solutions, right? Who would you talk to? Anybody writing something down? 
Now I want you to write down who the end user is. Who's the person on the front line who has to use this? So often, these great inventions are developed, but the end user has like a basic problem with it, right? They can't, it's not usable to them. So who is the end user? Is it gonna be a service person on the front lines? Is it gonna be somebody on a Navy ship? Or is it gonna be somebody in corporate America or somebody in the White House or somebody in a university who has to decide when they go on lockdown or something? But who is the end user? Who's really the end user? And now I want you to think about a place you'll go or a thing you'll do that is just creative, like a museum, a movie, read a spy novel, read a book you wouldn't normally read. If you want a business book, I got a list from here to Miami, let me know. Jerry Hirschberg would give people weird projects to do at NDI. He'd give them like a vacuum cleaner for Japan to create, or a toaster oven, anything other than a vehicle. He would close the shop and go to a museum. Where's a, where's a place you're gonna go to get yourself, just jar loose from your moorings, okay? I love this quote from Jerry. While conscious focus shifts elsewhere, the subconscious will mine any new activity, sifting through it for previously unseen connections. Previously unseen connections, that's what you want. For bits and parts, to fill the nagging void of unfinished and unresolved questions. These might be unfinished and unresolved questions you didn't even know you had. And then something goes out, triggers in your brain and you go, oh, what if I connected this and this? Maybe you wanna to go to a comedy club. Okay, I know this is weird, fly with me here. This is a study from Psychology Today. Believe it or not, they did a study where they had improvisational comedians and product developers, designers, and they gave them a test. And the comedians came up with 20% more new ideas, and those ideas were 25% more creative than the product designers whose job it is to come up with new product ideas. Hello? Right? You've got to get the brain going in a different way. Read a novel. I know some people in, the, in intelligence who read Tom Clancy novels, right? This is amazing. Okay, these, these are extraordinary. You've got to check this out. This is a company called Applied Imagination. This is the U.S. Capitol made from twigs, acorns, Branches, it's made from plant-based materials, 100%. It's really amazing stuff. Peas, banana leaves, all kinds of nature stuff. They're, they're at the Botanic Gardens. I interviewed this woman on my podcast, too. She talks about how it's done. But you want to talk about creativity and, like, breaking loose from your moorings of the status quo? So who are you going to follow? Who are you going to talk to? When, when are you gonna go to these places and who are you gonna take with you? Write it down so that you can follow through. By the way, Albert Michelson was also a painter and a composer. I wonder if that helped him come up with E equals MC with uh, 186,000 miles per second squared. He developed the interferometer and the metroscopy to measure it, which has never been exceeded to this day. So I want to do a few takeaways here to sum up. Question the data. It's biased. It's flawed. It's been designed by humans. And it's incomplete, especially for you guys. It's incomplete, right? Challenge assumptions, including your own, especially your own. But in a meeting, when somebody presents an idea, think about in that moment, well, what are you assuming to be true? Seek input from unusual sources, from weird Un odd sources, like jar your brain loose to come up with, try to make weird connections. Hire the outliers, hire the spark. And it doesn't even have to be a, sorry, a full-time hire. It can be somebody that you bring in as a consultant or somebody to facilitate something or somebody to join a meeting. You might even, as you're sitting here right now, think about people that you've interviewed for a job. 
Is there anybody there who you liked but you thought would not fit in? I want to talk to them. Write down their name. You might want to go back and see what they're up to or revisit their information and see if that's somebody you want to talk to again. Be aware of how you respond. Self-awareness is so critical. If you're shutting down a conversation, if you're shutting down an idea, it might be your idea that gets shut down. And then they might want to name a building after you. Wouldn't that be cool? It's kind of weird to walk into Michelson Hall, I got to tell you. And pull out your notes when you get back to your office and take those actions. Commit to doing it. Call up those people. Email those people to make a time. Put it on your calendar. You've got to act on it, right? So I hope you're all inspired by the struggle that Albert Michelson went through to challenge, to attempt the impossible. You guys every day are, are attempting the impossible. And the American people, thank you. So thank you very much. I welcome your questions. <laughs> Follow through is so important. OK, questions? Yes, Mr. Carl. Excuse me. Thank you for your presentation. You said there's five generations in the workplace now? Yes. I know baby boomers, Gen Xers, I know millennials. Well, you, have, you also have people from even before the baby boomers. You even have World War II generations. I mean, there's a septi three septuagenarians running for president of the United States right now, one of whom is in the White House. Does that give you a clue? Um, so you actually have that generation also. And then you also have kids in high school. <laughs> we were talking about this before, you know. They're getting, in, getting into the workforce now even as interns. So you actually have, and, and some of those generations break across different demographic uh, psychographics. So even the millennials and baby boomers. You know, there's the, the baby boomers who were born closer to the, in the late 1940s are different, have a different value system than those born in the early 60s, right? So you also have gradations of that. Absolutely. But that's the beauty of it, actually. A lot of people say, oh, you know, people call me. How do you manage millennials? People. These are people. It's about attitude, not age. Oh, my God, really? Hello? Right? People are people. But let's let that friction give us new ideas. Who else? Questions? Come on. You guys are in the business of asking questions. Thanks. Your great, great uncle's persistent motivation. That's a very good question. Um, I think that he will, first of all, they were living in Virginia City, uh, Nevada. They were not well off. Um, he was always super smart. By the way, this is a weird thing to tell you, but there's an episode of Bonanza that he was referenced in and is in. Okay, figure that one out, right? Um, I guess because they were in Virginia City, I'm not sure. One more time because never been in Virginia City Oh, cool. It's kind of well, exactly. I think it was, I mean, he was always super smart. And I think he saw it as a way to uh, upward mobility, right? And to use his, his brain and wanting to serve the country. Um, how he happened upon the Naval Academy, to be honest, I don't really know. But he sure was persistent in it. It's kind of astonishing, isn't it? Um, I don't know of anybody else in my family tree prior to him who was in the Navy. In fact, his official Nobel picture is in his Navy uniform. Um, and they have a lot of his, they have some of his, his original interferometer and, and uh, metroscopy at the Naval Academy in Michelson Hall and in the museum. So any of you who are physicists or whatever want to go check it out, it's really cool. Who else? Hi. So what was your craziest idea that even you thought was crazy? And what did you were you able to pursue it? And what was the context and what were some outcomes? From oh, I appreciate that. So um, I'll tell you about my methane-free Christmas. So um, electric cars are obviously methane-free, right? And reindeers are not. 
Um, but, shall we say, right, diplomatically put. Um, so I, I marched, it was really funny because I'd walk into literally the door jam of my, uh, the president of the company's office and he'd look at me and he'd go, uh-oh, I know you're here to take me out of my comfort zone. Give me a minute. And he'd grab the arms of his chair and he'd go, okay, hit me. Because he knew I was going to come. He'd go, how do you come up with this stuff? So what I did, though, was I knew that we couldn't, I couldn't spend a lot of money, right? But we also had to work through dealers. We can't sell directly to the public. And that there were incentives for buying electric cars, right, the federal tax credit. So what I did was I developed, um, and everybody around Christmas, you want to do something uh, with charities, et cetera. So I developed a multi-aspect partnership where I had dealers collect toys for kids. I had, de I, basically, I talked the dealers into doing a lot. So I had the dealers donate a car to the local boys and girls club in their area to decorate. And then one of the executives from the dealership dressed up as Santa Claus, put the toys in our gem cars. They're Global Electric Motor Cars. You probably, the, the military has hundreds, maybe thousands of these cars. And they delivered the toys in them. And it went viral as a methane-free Christmas. I mean, like all over the web, all over the media. It was like, what the bleep? But it was considered a methane, you know, Santa Claus methane-free. I mean, my, thought, my boss thought I'd just like completely lost my mind. And then when it went viral, he was like, I don't understand how this happened, but I'm not going to worry about it. So that was pretty wild. That was, that was, that was one of them. I created a partnership with AERP also. I looked at the data and I said, um, this maxim, but you know, again, I didn't just look at the top line, you know, the marketing summary, the research summary. You gotta go underneath it and look at what's behind it. So I dug underneath and I saw, to me it was screaming AERP. So I cold called AERP. And my boss said, well, I'm not gonna pay for you to go out there, but you know, if you want to pursue it, that's okay, but I'm not paying for your trip. So I was coming back to D.C. to do a speech anyway, so I set up a meeting with this one guy who I got on the phone. I walked in. There were six people in the room. Two and a half hours later, we had a multi-pronged partnership addressing every aspect of uh, AARP and their conferences, et cetera, and legislation to get... Uh, um, dedicated parking spaces in front of the supermarkets, like you have uh, handicapped ones. And it was so successful doing videos and transporting VIPs. It was so successful that Chrysler adopted for the whole company, all of Chrysler. And they played my video until the company was sold to another company in the collapse of Chrysler when the government took over. So you got to get, you know, when, the, when I first went to my boss and said AARP, he was like, what? How does that work? Right? Yeah, I mean, he's like, how did you connect these dots? Who else? Come on, come on, come on, come on. I need a woman. All these women in the audience. Yes, yay! Hi. Oh, I love that idea. First of all, my podcast, thank you for asking, is called Green Connections Radio, which you can't really see on that, and I'm not slide, I'm not sure why. But the, the uh, website address is up there, greenconnectionsradio.com, and I'm on Apple Podcasts. Um, that's the, I put that picture up there because that's the actual icon of my show. Um, and I talk innovation with all my guests. Um, so here's what I would suggest. First of all, Awareness is the first step. When you you just said something really critical. You said, you know you've got the bureaucratic, be careful in the back of your head. So the first, the, that awareness is huge. I would, this is, I would go, I would make a note to myself going into this meeting that says, challenge the status quo. 
or explore. And just because you're going to get sucked into the meeting and you're going to get sucked into the bureaucratic style and you want to keep a piece of yourself back, right? It's like you have a, a shield around you and you want to you want to keep a piece of yourself so that you're not getting sucked into that and you can stand back from it and then then at moments you can say great here but you know what i'm concerned about is i'm i'm you know maybe we're assuming that the data is 100% accurate maybe we're assuming that xyz won't happen maybe you know what if you know have you know how did you get there you know what if we brought in somebody from here, you know, I'm hearing that it might make sense to bring in somebody from toxicology, even though we're talking about something else. Um, because I think they've sort of addressed a similar problem. It can be a similar problem on a different topic. So you can come in with what ifs. You can come in with, um, in neurolinguistic programming is what would happen if. And it, what it does is it actually makes your brain think about what would happen if. That phrase, it's kind of cool, right? So self-awareness is key. Understand when you're coming in with these assumptions. Give yourself permission to not be sucked in and keep a piece of yourself back so that you can stand back and say, well, you know, but the, the data is flawed or I saw other data that said X, or, you know, what other data do you have that contradicts that? And I can be happy to talk to you more about it afterwards, too. Does that help? Okay, good. Welcome. Anybody else? Thank you for your work, too, all of you. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Come on. <laughs> You guys are in the, the question asking business. I mean, you're, you're scientists and chemists and toxicologists. You probe for a living. You're being too easy on me. Come on. Yay. Go ahead. So, yeah, I will. Yeah, and I realize I probably should have repeated hers, too. Um, how do you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in repeating this, uh, but I'm doing this for the microphone, but is um, how, do you, how do you get the uniforms to come together and... Um, Oh, the unicorns. Okay. To the, you mean uh, by un well, the word unicorn in the cor in the business sector usually means, you know, um, a billion dollar startup that was unexpected. When you say a unicorn, what do you mean? So the, the unicorns themselves are having trouble collaborating. So the, that, that's where internal politics and turf wars and cultural issues come into play. Because that's, frankly, an attitude problem. No, I'm serious, right? If those people are coming in saying, well, you know, I'm a, I know because I'm, you know, this specialist and yada, yada. Well, challenge them politely and respectfully. How you, that's where I think having somebody in the room who is not a unicorn, maybe it's you, maybe you are a unicorn, having somebody in the room who can facilitate that um, would be really helpful because what you want to do is say, well, great, let's list the, all of, everybody has, an, has these ideas, let's list them on a whiteboard, for example. And then let's break down and look at where are they, where, how can these work together? What if we put all of, what if this was a puzzle how would we put these pieces together to come up with something even better that would solve the problem? And what are the, what are the assumptions behind each idea? And what are the nuggets behind each idea? So you might even, you list the ideas, and then you might sort of do a mind map and break out the assumptions for each one. 
you know, idea A, idea B, idea C, and then say, well, you know, chart it out and say, oh, look, this overlay, this could work with this. What if we combine, you know, if, if this technology might be used for this, but, you know, and then if we made it remote, then maybe we can do this, and then if we need it to be, uh, we, can we put it on the, the aircraft that we need it to go on? Well, great, then that's where this idea can come in. Do you see what I mean? I find that sometimes mapping it out can help people see the relationships and, and the mapping it out, putting them all on one, on one whiteboard or whatever, frankly, is egalitarian. It sets them all on, the, on an equal footing. Instead of coming in with going, my idea is the greatest. Okay, well, yeah, right, get over it. I mean, it's like, really? People win the Nobel Prize sometimes 20, 30 years after they did something, right? So don't tell me how great your idea is today. Right? And it's that collaboration. The other thing I would think about is, in those teams, who is it coming from? What's the agenda of that unicorn? Are they, are they you know, is it all, you know, is, is everybody from the Army? Is everybody, or are they all from different branches? You know, or who's from the private sector? Who's from whatever? What's their agenda? What's their focus? Because that's the lens to her point about coming in with assumptions. That's their point that they're coming in with. They're coming in from that vantage point. So you might even, when you map it out, put in, and, and, and whoever is the facilitator might even collect some of these in advance and do a matrix. We have, you know, Joe from the Army, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you can see where the agenda and the focal point might be, okay? Because a toxicologist is going to be focused on chemical weapons, but somebody in ammunition is going to be focused on cleaning up a, a site, say, after the, the base is closed and a BRAC closing or something, right? So they're going to have different agendas, but that's where the creativity can come in. So I would say have a facilitator map it out and then say, well, what if we take one from column A, one from this idea from this, and one from this idea from that? Is that helpful? Yeah, okay, good. I'll be happy to talk to you more about that if you like as well. Anybody else? Yes. This week, I have a question. So you mentioned, you mentioned this theme of rushing the data. Right. So you've ever run into a situation where that creates a problem because pushing the data is really just validating your own sense of belief. You're not believing what the information tells you because it doesn't necessarily validate what you think is true. Great point. So, at what point does it become destructive to say, hey, we're not buying into this because it doesn't match right? That's a great question. So, what, what, when you're, it basically is confirmation bias, right? I'm going to dis, I'm going to dis, I'm going to dismiss it because it doesn't fit into my current belief system. It's like people watch certain media and don't watch other media at all because it challenges their confirmation bias, right? Um, first of all, awareness is step one. The fact that you're aware of it is huge. Now, I mean that because we can't change what we're not aware of. The other is, I'm not saying completely dismiss the data. I'm saying keep it in perspective and understand where the flaws in the data might be or where it might be incomplete. So even in today's world where we think that everybody knows everything about us, um, they don't, A. And B, they're wrong. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've seen profiles of me. I mean, okay, so here's a funny story. I actually got an analysis of myself that started with shy and timid. <laughs> Need I say more? Okay. So you have assessments, you have profiling, you know. You, you, it's a matter of keeping it in perspective and then challenging it. I'm not saying dismiss it outright, but just look at the fact that how was this data programmed? What were the assumptions in the artificial intelligence in the coding that was put in? Because human beings are making those decisions on the spot in front of their computer, right? So it's going to have, that may even have confirmation bias. Okay, so here's another example. 
But by the way, you can tell, if I had applied through the Chrysler applicant tracking system, they would never know my name, right? I had no keywords. I wasn't in North Dakota, right? I mean, forget about it. Applicant tracking systems are a nightmare. If I had gone through USA Jobs, you guys probably would have never found me because I'm not in, you know, chemical weapons, et cetera, right? So that's what I'm talking about is the systems are programmed right now. And, and frankly, applicant tracking systems are a nightmare for a whole, nother set, a whole bunch of sets of reasons I'll be happy to talk to you about because they, they, they favor fit and they favor, again, their program. They haven't been changed in 45, in, well, since women entered the workforce, really. So, or much less anybody of color or different age groups or generations. So I'm not saying dismiss it. I'm just saying, A, be aware of it, and B, question what's behind it and where the gaps might be. Like, what, are we, what is this data not telling us that we need to know would be a critical piece, too. Yes. So, from what you're saying, and it, I, I might be oversimplifying, always seek life elsewhere because what you're saying is even if you are a unique thinker, if everybody's looking externally, you're not going to move up. If, 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 if we're looking at this problem and you always want to seek that outlier, how do you prove internally that you're an outlier? How do you prove internally that you're an outlier? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm walking to the mic. Um, I've been instructed to stay with the mic if possible. Um, how do you prove that you're an outlier? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, by coming up with creative ideas, you don't have to. You don't have to prove that you're an outlier. You just you just have to come up with creative ideas. You can be. You can know that you're an outlier and feel like an outlier. I got to tell you, in Fargo, North Dakota, I felt like an outlier. Okay. <laughs> I love these people, but in, and yet I was very much belonging. It's not mutually exclusive. You can belong and be the creative spark at the same time. Am I answering your question? Or are you, are you asking about hiring an outlier? Or are you talking about being an outlier internally and coming up with creative ideas internally? Yeah. But to, to be an outlier, to think that way, you're constantly going to go beyond your comfort zone. And to really do that, that involves new places, right. new things, new organizations. Right. Not just reaching out to them to solve your problem, but going elsewhere to solve it. Exactly. Exactly. So you are, you are going outside your comfort zone, that's the point, right? But... I can also say that to you guys because you have the fundamentals, right? You have the, the education, you have the training, but what I'm saying is don't let the education and the training be enough and don't let it limit you because to his point, it doesn't fit into your box, right? And to her point, the bureaucracy doesn't block it, but it's both and. You have to be, have a level of mastery in your skill set, but then also allow yourself to reach beyond, as you say, go out of your comfort zone. I mean, okay, did City Girl take a risk by going to North Dakota? You bet. My friends thought I needed a frontal lobotomy. I was like, you're going where? But it was great, okay? And it shook me up. I'm a better everything because of it. I'm a better person. I'm more creative. I've learned a ton. I learned more about communicating with people. I lived in eight or nine states. So each experience gives you something that is different. So part of it is seeing what you're getting from each experience that contributes to your ideas. What's different about this? How is this making me think differently? Does that make sense? Does that help? I'd be happy to chat with you more about it, if you like. Anybody else? I'll, I'll make sure that I'll, I'll let my time police people monitor the time, since I'm timeless. Anybody else? 
Come on. If you are sitting on a question, don't be shy. We don't do shy. Yes. Yes. So she asked, how do you keep one voice from dominating the conversation, basically, and, and being the force? Um, <laughs> I can speak from personal experience. Uh, sometimes you just, if it's you, you just shut up. I mean, frankly. But I mean, seriously. There are times, and I'm going to be frank with you, I will sit in a room and I'll do this. To keep myself from saying something. I mean, literally, I'm being transparent. But if it's you, you have to know when to shut up. If it's other people, what I do is when I'm facilitating a meeting and people are not participating, like I'm bothering you guys now, right, to come forth, I will purposely go to people who have been quiet, especially in a small-scale meeting, and say, Sally, we haven't heard from you. Joe, we haven't heard from you. What are you thinking? And then sometimes you just have to let the silence sit there because some people need the space to come forward. If you, fill, if you ask somebody their opinion and you're too quick to fill the space, you shut them down. And those of us who move fast might want to fill the space. And so you have to just let them fill the space. As a reporter, I find that if you're quiet, people will fill the space. And it's magic in a room. If there's, people love to fill the space. So a lot of times it's just being quiet, believe it or not. But it's also, you have to actively pull people out sometimes and say, what do you think? And they go, well, you know, I don't know. And I go, well, come on, you're sitting there, you're absorbing this, you've got this, that, and the other experience. How, does that, how do you put those together? And, and, and pull them out. Actively pull them out. But if, you're, if somebody's dominating, you know, somebody has to, I mean, to be honest with you, there are times when I'll just gently put my hand on somebody who is taking over too much, or I'll say, you know, well, we, hang on, we haven't heard from so-and-so. I'd like to hear from him. Even if you're not a leader in the room, you can say, well, I, you know, I'd like to hear from... Miranda over here, you know, or I'd like to explore this. Can we just hang on a second and do? So you can take a leadership role and give them the space, give them the floor. By the way, if there is a mic, you can always just hand them the mic, which takes the mic away from the person who's dominating. Anybody else? How's my time, Felice? We... Are we at time? Yes. One more, One more question. Okay, who's going to be the last question? Drum roll. Come on. Don't be shy. We don't do shy here. Come on. Somebody else has a question. Yes. Yay. especially in a bureaucracy, right? We've always done it this way. How's that working for you? That's a good question to come back with, right? Well, if we've always done it this way and we're still in this predicament, then maybe we need to look at it another way. Or instead of just not just attacking them, when somebody says, well, we've always done it this way, and believe me, I got that every day in corporate America. Um, what I would, you, I'm going to say this. Sometimes you don't want to give those things oxygen. If you get pulled into their discussion, you're giving it oxygen. So in, when I say, how's that working for you, that's a kind of a snippy co back, you know, comment back, right? So you don't necessarily want to literally say that, but it's what's going on in your head. But some, what I find, sometimes people pick on me for doing something, and I'll look at them and say, well, it's working for me. And that shuts down that criticism. So what you could say is, okay, and we're not getting, 
we're still trying to solve X, so what if we took a left turn instead? Why don't we just like think about it? Just explore it. You know, we're not, we're not necessarily committed to this other way, but let's just entertain it, just for kicks and giggles. Let's just, let's just see where it goes and make it, again, that's where the, the safe space comes in. And whoever is in a leadership role, I mean, part of a bureaucracy is you've got these hierarchies, right? So whoever is in a leadership role in the meeting, if possible, should turn around, could turn around and say, well, okay, well, let's just explore that for a minute. And let's just say, well, what if? What would happen if? Just for fun, okay? Because you could, depending upon what, what the way we've always done it is and what the problem is, if you're still wrestling with the problem, obviously it's not working. So you could, instead of say, well, how's that working for you? You could come back and say, well, okay, we're, but we still have, you know, this, this is showing us that it's not, that we still have to work on this, or we still have to work on that. We still have to work on that. So you're pointing out areas to work on so that you're in effect challenging the status quo without putting it in their face. So that you're, you're saying, you're pointing out the reflections of it not working instead of saying it's not working directly, which can be somewhat confrontational. But if you point out where it's not working and then say, well, just like for the hell of it, let's try this. Let's just see where that goes because we're still in this place. We're still trying to solve this. You know, we haven't figured out how to move the chemical weapons out of Syria yet remotely, so let's just try this other weird way. The worst that happens is we discover it's not going to work and make it safe. If you say the worst that happens is, then that usually disarms the situation for people. It's like if you're having to make a choice, like when people were moving me to Fargo, I said, hey, the worst that happens is I hate it and I leave and I come back, right? So there's always, if you can deal with the worst that happens, and that usually, when people say we've always done it this way, they're afraid of the change. So if you point out what the possible, what the worst case scenario is, that takes away their fear because it brings it out into the open and says, well, we know we can deal with whatever the worst case scenario is. We just go back to this. Does that help? I'd be happy to talk to you more about it if you like. Got it? Thank you, and thank you for your work, really.